Welcome back everyone to Curiosities of Staffordshire. Today once more we're visiting the north of Stoke-on-Trent in the historic parish of Chell. We are in fact just a bit further down the road from the site of the former Turnhurst Hall, which we covered in a previous episode looking at the history of the hall and its significance to local engineer James Brindley. Today we're here to look at the history and what remains of the Walstanton and Burslem Union Workhouse, famously or infamously fictionalised in the novel Clayhanger by renowned local author and social critic Arnold Bennett. Bennett called his version of the workhouse the Bastille, in a rather ominous comparison to the dreaded f- prison fortress of Paris. To paraphrase Bennett's description, The Bastille was on top of a hill a couple of miles long. It proved to be the largest building that Darius had ever seen, and indeed it was the largest in the district. They stood against its steep sides like flies against a kennel. The Bastille's real-life counterpart stood on Turnhurst Road, further down from Turnhurst Hall towards Chell. Indeed, it was very much one of the largest buildings in the district, and would have stood out like a sore thumb against the semi-rural landscape of the day. Looking at sketches from the time of the building's construction, you can understand the source of Bennett's inspiration. In reality, Chell Workhouse was indeed a towering, intimidating complex, and many a local resident has attested to the building's sinister appearance over the years. Today, when someone mentions the workhouse, one typically thinks of oppression, squalor, gruel and forced labour. A dreaded place where someone went only after they'd hit rock bottom and would avoid at all costs. People living off watery porridge... Overcrowded rooms of coffin-shaped beds, rife with disease and misery. A place where you'd be worked to death and there was no going back from. This image is perhaps owed more to fiction than reality. Writers such as Charles Dickens and indeed Arnold Bennett painted the workhouse in a less than favourable light. That isn't to say that these conditions didn't exist. Many early Union workhouses were not purpose-built, and made use of existing facilities from before the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834 came into force and introduced stricter regulations and uniformity. These existing poorhouses would vary wildly from region to region, and many buildings were hundreds of years old by the time the Union would reform them. Conditions could typically be crowded and unhygienic in such places, but newer, purpose-built Union workhouses were often of a much better standard. Large and intimidating as these new buildings were, they offered living spaces, room for segregation of the sick and infirm, and ample room for medical facilities and outdoor spaces. Workhouses are sometimes described as being deliberately intimidating and grim in appearance, designed to deter people from taking refuge there. But the scale of the dour functional layout can be attributed more to practical considerations than aesthetics, really. They weren't, all, they weren't all situated as to cast a grim shadow over the community, but often built outside of large population centres where there was more space. Typically, to enter a workhouse, you wouldn't necessarily take the long, dreaded, shameful walk up to the front door, as described in Clayhanger, but be referred by a parish liaison, usually much closer to home. Founded in 1838, Chell Workhouse, or the Walstanton and Burslem Union Workhouse to give its full name, was one such sizeable purpose-built structure designed to accommodate up to 400 inmates and costing around £6,000, or just over half a million pounds in today's money. As the name suggests, it was designed to cover a large area encompassing much of the northern potteries and beyond. Some 40 years later, on the 1881 census, 278 inmates and 14 staff are listed as residents, with paupers being born as far and wide as America, Germany and Ireland, the local coal, iron and pottery industries attracting many a migrant worker from all over. At least one is listed as having been born and raised in one workhouse or another, which is an indicator of how integral the workhouse was to the welfare system of the day. Although in contrast to the popular myth of once you entered a workhouse you could never leave, most residents in the workhouse were temporary. However, the workhouse would become a long-term home for many a society outcast over the years, not because they were forced to stay, but often because they had nowhere else to go. For example, in 1861, there were more than 20 long-term residents listed at Chell, and that that is those who'd been there for five or more years, 
mainly children with infirmities or learning difficulties, described in very insensitive Victorian terms as imbeciles. Despite the workhouse's early reputation for being hard and unforgiving, such people would most likely enjoy a more stable and comfortable life in the workhouse than they would in the outside world. This is before any concept of a welfare state as we know it today existed, and workers and families, the disabled or the elderly, had little protection in case of redundancy or incapacity. There's also no national health service, so those outside the workhouse were unlikely to be able to afford any medical or old age care. Outbreaks of diseases of poverty such as cholera would plague workhouses over the years due to the concentration of vulnerable people and often unsanitary conditions in the early days. Vagrants were often shunned or forced to endure particularly harsh conditions by such institutions due to their reputation for spreading disease and lice. In this regard, workhouses such as Chell marked a big step forward in terms of hygiene. Chell allowed vagrants as it had more space for temporary quarters and could keep them separate from the more permanent residents. They also introduced delousing processes for any vagrants wishing to seek refuge, but eventually banned them altogether in the early 20th century. The early grim reputation of the workhouse made famous by Dickens did improve over time, however, as a series of scandal de- scandals exposed the meagre diet and harsh treatment of the various establishments in the Victorian era. There were moves towards a more varied diet, establishments even being issued with a kitchen handbook in 1901, with instructions for more nutritious and generous meals than the basic broths, gruels, bread and cheese that had previously made up to about 90% of the workhouse diet. There are also experiments in some workhouses to offer the the chance of skilled work in fields such as bootmaking or joinery, in addition to the menial and unskilled work that paupers usually endured. Entertainment was even introduced, with concerts and day trips to the seaside being included, often much to the chagrin of those of a more conservative persuasion. I guess some things never change. Medical care was another area in which the Union workhouses made great strides in the latter half of the 19th century. Where early workhouses had, had untrained and often elderly nurses to look after a very basic infirmary, as Florence Nightingale's reforms became widely adopted, full-time medical staff were employed and facilities were greatly expanded, with far greater emphasis on cleanliness and hygiene. For many, this was the only medical treatment they were ever likely to get. Many workhouses would expand to include medical buildings, a notable example being what is now the Royal Stoke Hospital, the site of which still incorporates many former workhouse buildings. At Chell, a hospital wing was added in 1894 adjacent to the main building, which continued to be in use for over a hundred years, later as Westcliff Hospital. Many of these establishments stood the nation in good stead as convalescent hospices during the First World War and the flu pandemic that followed. The workhouse at Chell would close in 1922, with the workhouse system being abolished altogether in the early 1930s. The country was making strides towards a more modern conception of welfare and poverty relief. Westcliff Hospital, however, would continue to be in use right until the mid-2000s, with the building eventually being demolished in 2009. The main workhouse building stood derelict right up until its demolition in 1993. The site of the workhouse and the hospital is now a modern sheltered accommodation and retirement village, which presents a much more welcoming and comforting prospect than the original edifice. Although faint echoes of the old perimeter wall are still visible in places, serving as a reminder of its former life. Though it has been 15 years since the last of the original buildings attached to the workhouse was demolished, there is one part of the site which continues to be somewhat preserved, albeit, as with many a historic site in Stoke-on-Trent in a rather neglected state, the area in question is the site of the pauper's graveyard, who, where those unfortunate to pass away at the workhouse were buried. The graveyard appears on maps well into the 20th century, many years after the last burial took place there in 1940. The land of the burial ground is now somewhat unceremoniously located on the border between two modern housing estates, which, modern as they are, were under under construction before the demolition of the workhouse building that once overshadowed them.
Although little remains, the site has some echoes of its former life visible amongst the overgrown trees and shrubbery that covers a large part of it. There is a monument marking the entrance to the path leading down to where the cemetery was located, unveiled in 1992, which acknowledges the site of the cemetery and includes a respectful message of rest in peace. Some locals remember the ground being ceremonially blessed during the construction of the housing estates, and the land of the burial ground being specifically excluded from any building plans in respect to its status as a place of rest. This is perhaps shown most starkly in today's Google satellite photos of the area, which clearly show the patch of greenery in between the two sizeable housing estates either side. Comparing it to a map from the early 20th century, you can see that the marked footprint of the site almost fully matches up with the site today. You can still roughly make out the squarish tree line that was once the hedgerow marking the boundary of the cemetery. As for remains of the cemetery itself, although badly overgrown, there are, there are a few simple headstones amongst the undergrowth, although you really have to know where to look. The only photo I could find showing their presence was from over 20 years ago. Still visible amongst the trees, though, are a small set of iron railings from the original perimeter fence, and intertwined with the overgrown trees, you can still make out stretches of the, ro the Rowan hedgerow. To visit the site, you can take the public footpath directly opposite the entrance to the retirement village on Turnhurst Road. The plaque is located right by the entrance on a preserved patch of cobbled pavement. The cemetery itself is further down the slope, bisected by a tarmac footpath connecting the housing estates. If you have a keen eye, you may spot the exposed railings and headstones amongst the undergrowth. The site lies more or less adjacent to the Scotia Valley Greenway, which tracks the route of the former Pottery's Loopline Railway. Should you find yourself following this path, which is also part of the National Cycle Network, be sure to stop and pause for a moment to take in this small piece of history. Given the state of the site today, you'd be forgiven for not realising that was, there was ever any significance to it at all, so I hope this video has helped to shed some light on its history. I hope you found this little tour around the Chell area informative. In future, I plan to make some more vi videos looking at the route of the aforementioned Pottery's loop line and the various stations upon it, so stay tuned for those. Please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you next time for more Curiosities of Staffordshire. Thank you very much for watching.